Good evening, Orchard Park Central School District. My name is Dave Lillick, Superintendent of Schools, and I'd like to welcome you to our first Parent Information Series event for the 2021-22 school year. First, I'd like to start with some thank yous. I'd like to thank Dr. Lisa Kruger, our Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum and Pupil Services, for all of her work in organizing this year's series. I'd also like to thank our three presenters this evening, Amanda Mulder, Amy Klub, and Chuck Crone, our social workers from the high school. Also, thank you to Sarah Horning, our tech director, for all of the behind the scenes work that was needed in order to make uh, this evening's event possible. For our parents, again, welcome. Uh, we know that this evening's event will provide you with information that you will find incredibly helpful and useful when you are engaging your child in conversations centered around social emotional health, mental health, uh, as well as just the challenges that all of us have faced over the last 18 to 20 months during the pandemic. So we look forward uh, to uh, this partnership continuing throughout this year, and we know that you will find this evening uh, very beneficial. Again, welcome and thank you for joining us. Good evening. My name is Amy Kluv and I'm the school social worker in House One at the high school. It is my pleasure to be with you tonight to discuss how we're gonna move forward after the pandemic. I've been in the district for 21 years and have thoroughly enjoyed my time here. I've really learned how resilient people are. And I know that we will be getting through these next couple months or years or whatever it may be to recover from what we've experienced in the past year and a half. We are here tonight to talk about the foundations of mental health, to really talk about where we start, how we move forward, and what we always need to look at to start with. In the past year and a half, strong emotions have been evoked. We've done teleconferences, we did the hybrid model at the high school, Google Meets, life has sort of been turned upside down. We've had social and economic upheaval with our families, our friends, illnesses, different things that have happened that were not typical to what we usually see. And we knew that it was gonna be hard. We just weren't sure exactly how difficult that would be. There is prior research on pandemics and epidemics where people report distress, worsening of mental or physical health. But people, again, I wanna repeat, people are resilient and we will move through this. A small fraction of people moving forward will deal with chronic symptoms. So possible diagnoses of PTSD, anxiety, or depression. But most of us will move through this and refine our balance. The risk factors included when there's going to be issues include poor social supports, financial difficulty, food or housing instability, or a history of mental illness. But building social supports now and taking care of ourselves will help us in recovery. It seems that much is what we've learned from past disasters and epidemics does hold true with COVID. Surveys, including those collected by the Center for Disease Control, have shown substantial increases in self-reported behavioral symptoms. According to one CDC report, which surveyed all adults across the US, 31% of respondents reported symptoms of anxiety or depression, 13% reported having started increased use in substance abuse, 26 reported stress-related symptoms, and 11% have reported serious thoughts of suicide in the past 30 days. These numbers are nearly double the rate of what we had seen before the pandemic. Children also have had major disruptions. Children often echo what their parents are experiencing. They may have issues with that in terms of even seeing a parent that in a divorce situation where they were isolated, um, different social isolations, friendships developing, social skills, gaps in health care. Many parents are reporting poor mental health outcomes in their children. In May 2020, shortly after the pandemic began, 29% said their children's mental or emotional health was already harmed. And in 2020, of Octo October of 2020, 31% had said that their children's mental or emotional health was worse than, worse than before the pandemic. Children have exhibited increased irritability, clinginess, difficulty falling asleep, fear, and poor appetite. Anecdotally speaking, Chuck, Amanda, and I have noticed a rise in mental health issues amongst a population that we hadn't seen before. Students who didn't surface now are surfacing, and we're helping them as they move through this transition. But where do we start with this transition? 
We always look to start with the foundations of mental health. Learning to cope with stress in a healthy way will make you and the people you care about become more resilient. For some that has gone very well and for others it's definitely a challenge. Stress can cause feelings of anger, fear, sadness, worry, changes in appetite, energy, difficulty concentrating or sleeping, physical reactions such as headaches, body aches, stomach problems, and worsening of chronic health issues. Also worsening mental health issues and increase in substance abuse. So where do we start? As social workers, we really feel that it is important to start with those basics of fundamentals of mental health. Medication and psychotherapy can also be very helpful as a very important part of addressing these issues. But to begin the process, it is vital that we start with exercise, nutrition, and sleep. And if I wanna put this in terms of understanding a physical ailment, we would call something like arthritis a physical, um, a physical problem that most people would think is taken care of with medication. And although that's true, when you have arthritis, you also have to consider diet, exercise, getting adequate sleep. Immune system disorders are more than just fixing them with one thing. And we want to say the same thing about mental health concerns. It's more than just um, taking a medication or just seeing somebody. There's also fundamentals that you can do yourself. It's the same with preventing mental health issues like anxiety and depression. The body and the mind are connected. So often, those who we see that are having issues with their mental health are under-exercised, undernourished, and under-rested. I'm gonna begin the presentation today with how exercise affects the brain and mental health. I get a little technical in parts, but bear with me. I want you to understand the biology and why exercise is so important. To begin with, I wanna look back in history a little bit to see where we got today, as mental health has been worsening over the past decades. I'm going to begin with the Industrial Revolution. I know that goes back a little bit far, but really thinking about it, when we invented planes, trains, cars, uh, it was easier to get everywhere. You didn't have to move as much. Grocery stores made food easily accept, ac accessible. Um, there was a decrease in active jobs, especially for the middle class. More people were watching TV. The computer was invented. We really turned into widespread inactivity. And then 2020, the lockdown. People were afraid to go places. People stopped going to gyms. People stopped moving even more. And we've seen a further decline in mental health in that period of time. And I know that you know that exercise is good for you, but you know how it affects the brain. It improves mental health, cognitive functioning, memory, and reduces stress, social anxiety, and depression. I know most people exercise for the physical advantages that it gives them, and only a few do to have better brain function. But maybe after this presentation, you'll consider hitting the gym to improve your neurological function and your mental health. In an article entitled, Exercise is Brain Food in 2008, researcher Plowman gives three neuroscientific theories that explain how physical activity positively, positively impacts cognition. When exercising, oxygen saturation and blood vessel growth happen in areas of the brain that are associated with rational thinking as well as social, physical, and intellectual performance. Exercise drops stress hormones and increases the number of neurotransmitters like serotonin and norepinephrine, which accelerate information processing. Exercise helps neurotrophins, an insulin-like growth factor that supports the survival and differentiation of neurons in the developing brain and aids in synapse development in the adult brain. To put this in more layman's terms, what I'm basically saying is that there are neurological benefits from physical activity, which include decrease stress, decrease social anxiety, improve processing of emotion, short-term euphoria, increased energy and focus, improve memory, improve, improve blood circulation, and a decrease in brain fog. And we're gonna dive into these a bit more. Here are some interesting facts about the brain. Exercise actually increases the size of your brain. The anterior cingulate cortex and supplementary motor area is enlarged by exercise. This improves memory, task management, planning, and inhibition. So you can actually grow your brain to, um, to improve these areas. According to many scientific studies, exercise improves learning and memory abilities. 
Preston and Eichenbaum in 2013 found that the prefrontal cortex and hippocampus actually fortify memory-related cognition. Erickson in 2013 did a trial with 120 randomized adults. It increased the size, exercise increased the size of the anterior hippocampus by 2%. And from exercise, there was an improved spatial memory of the participants. This means that exercises increases the ability of people to actually recall information. In neuroscience and psychology, spatial memory refers to a type of memory that involves spatial orientation, the recalling of location of objects and where the specific events occurred. Fact two, anxiety damages the brain. Significant anxiety will release cortisol, which can damage the brain. 48% of people that suffer from severe anxiety. Significant anxiety can damage the brain by releasing too much cortisol. People that have significant anxiety are 48% more likely to develop dementia. The stretching and folding of the outer layer of the brain is triggered by cortisol. This also leads to different personality traits, including neuroticism, hypervigilance, and excitability. Cortisol, the stress hormone, can damage the part of the brain involved with memory and complex thinking. Using exercise to lower stress levels can actually reduce cortisol levels. Schoenfeld et al. in 2013 conducted a study which showed that exercise promotes the growth of neurons in the ventral hippocampus. That means that people could handle stress better. What is the hippocampus exactly? It's the deep part of the brain responsible for learning and memory, and it's activated during physical activity. The well, hippocampus of someone who leads a very sedentary lifestyle consists of younger neurons. They are untrained and easily excitable, and they fire when encountered by a minor stressor. So a situation appears more stressful. So how does this resolve? Through exercise, healthy neural connections are made in the hippocampus. So for example, if you are walking along and a bear came up to you, and it, what would, what, you would either freeze or flee or fight are the responses that we happen to have naturally. So when those connections are made better, you're more able to make the decision to either flee or to fight as opposed to just freeze because you have the ability to make good decisions under stress. This response enables us to decide whether we should physically engage in a situation or escape from the perceived threat. If there's no real threat, the neurotransmitters are released in the hippocampus and rational thinking is affected. I think of this sometimes as the faulty fire alarm system. For people with anxiety, uh, we can think of it as a faulty fire alarm. That fire alarm is going off when it shouldn't go off. And what happens is, is the anxiety goes up and it gets risen. We see this in the school situation quite a bit with our anxiety kids, where they feel like they struggle to be there, but really there is no actual threat. Um, so you have to stop and understand that there is a faulty wiring going on and that the neural development um, isn't quite where it needs to be. And exercise can address that by helping to form those neural connections to keep calm in situations. Exercising has the same flight, or flight response, so how is it that it's good? So it strengthens those neural connections and improves neural growth. And it releases something called GABA transmitters. Berkland in 2002 referred to GABA transmitters as the anti-anxiety molecule, and they are actually released during exercise. They prevent other neurons from firing so easily. And this differentiates a perceived threat from a real threat. It helps you manage stress and emotions and actually can reprogram the brain. Fact three, working at one task too long is counterproductive. Brain productivity um, tends to hover around one to two hours at a time. So when you're doing the same task for a long time, your productivity will lower after about two hours and it needs to refuel. The best way to refuel your brain is to take a short physical break. You can run more efficiently and you can lower brain fog. What is brain fog? 
Brain fog is kind of a clouding of consciousness, and it's a cognitive impairment that leads to poor focus, poor concentration, difficulty remembering things. And physical activity has shown to improve memory and learning as well as activating parts of the brain that enables the release of BDNF chemical and norepinephrine neurotransmitters. This increases alertness, concentration, and energy. Therefore, you have a healthier brain through your exercise. To sum that up, let's look at a chart which shows us that exercise increases levels of BDNF, serotonin, neuroepinephrine, and dopamine, as well as lowers cortisol and adrenaline. Let's take a minute to look at the feel-good sensation that you can get after exercise, sometimes called a runner's high. It can be a temporary euphoric state, and it's a sense of elation combined with contented feelings and a general sense of well-being. Exercising regularly can make that feeling last. But the most important aspect of exercise is its protective effects on the brain. The researcher Suzuki explains, think of your brain as a muscle. The more you're working out, the bigger and stronger your hippocampus and prefrontal cortex get. This is important because the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus are two areas that are most susceptible to the neurogenerative diseases and normal cognitive functioning and decline in aging. So which exercise is best? It's best to exercise uh, really for what you love, about 30 minutes a day, 150 minutes a week, and it's about quality, not quantity. Do what you love, make it regular, consider it a necessity, and consider it medicine for your brain. So what kind of exercise should you do? It's really about finding an exercise that you enjoy. Make it fun, not a chore. Walking is really the easiest choice. It's definitely my choice. In preparing for this presentation, which can be a little bit stressful, I definitely took some walks to think about how I wanted to present and what I wanted to say. And you don't need any special equipment. Most of us have a pair of sneakers laying around. When you can, consider going outdoors. About 20 minutes a day of sunshine and vitamin D can also raise your serotonin levels, which can make you feel better. Schedule exercise in your regular routine and add a variety so it doesn't get boring. Try exercising in the morning or the afternoon so it doesn't affect your sleep. And find a partner, exercise with your family, but most importantly, stick with it. Understanding the science behind exercising and why it's important to your mental health is really vital in making some of the changes that you need to make. There's been a lot of stress in the past year and a half and a lot of habits have been changed. Now it's time to refresh some of the habits that we have and include exercise in making sure that we're being healthy both physically and emotionally. Adjusting now can have a cascading effect on, on both of those areas. We're gonna now turn our attention to the next foundational piece of mental health, nutrition. We all know that eating healthy can make you feel better and nourish your body, but what does it actually do for the brain? Amanda Moeller will walk us through nutrition and the brain. Good evening, everyone. My name is Amanda Moeller, and I am the House 2 social worker at the high school. I am excited to be here with all of you discussing such an important topic for our students. I think we can all agree that over the last year and a half, our routines and daily regimens have been ever-changing. Slowly, and maybe without even realizing it, we have changed our diets, routines, sleep schedules, and activity levels. Personally, I know during the peak of the pandemic, I was not as active as I once was, nor was I always making the best decisions in regards to my nutrition. My once in a while late night snack had turned into a routine where my body was craving Oreos at exactly 10 p.m. every night. And if you're anything like me, you know you can't just have two Oreos. And if you can, that's some serious self-control and I'm very jealous. As Amy stated earlier, the COVID-19 pandemic has had a major impact on our lives overall. As school social workers, we have seen an increase in our students' needs in a variety of ways. Over this time, many of us, including our students, have experienced added stress, unhealthy eating habits, and isolation. As a school and district as a whole, we had to change from the norms of how we teach our students and how our students were expected to learn. As adults, this caused a major disruption in our daily routines, relationships, and even how we communicate. For our children and students, those changes hit even harder. 
Children are paying a hefty price through the indirect effects of the pandemic, including poor diet, taking care of their mental health, and social isolation. The powerful impacts of the pandemic on our children extend well beyond that of this viral infection and could have lifelong consequences on our children if not changed. With that being said, I'm here to talk about nutrition, what nourishes our body, impacts the brain, and how we can help our children and students. I'm sure all of us have come across this image at one point or another. For a little background, in 1992, the United States Department of Agriculture introduced the food pyramid as a tool to display what a healthy diet includes. Since then, there have been modifications made to the layout, to changing it from a pyramid to a plate. The plate works as a reminder to eat a balanced portion from all five of the food groups, grains, vegetables, fruits, proteins, and dairy. To meet the nutrient requirements laid out by the United States Department of Agriculture, you need to eat a variety of foods from each of the five food groups daily in the recommended amounts. Within the slide presented, you can see the breakdown of the foods needed. However, it is not necessary to eat from each food group at every meal. In fact, in some instances, you only need to eat some of the foods in each food group a couple times a week. As adults, we know what is good for us and what isn't, but at times we often let the hustle and bustle of the days get the best of us. We find ourselves skipping meals, eating snacks to make up for the lost meals, or even eating late at night due to obligations taking place during dinner time. As we fall into these routines, so do our children. In conversations with my students, I have found that many do, although not intentionally, skip meals. Some will pack a snack to nibble on throughout the day. Some will use their lunch periods as a time to work on missed assignments or study. And some are just too busy to remember to eat. Fun fact, that's why lunch is a mandatory period at the high school. This then leaves the student missing meals, snacking at inconsistent times, and leaving school exhausted without the nutrients they need for the remainder of the day. Then comes dinner time. Many are involved in prior obligations such as sports, music, clubs, and activities that hinder their ability to eat around a typical dinner time. But most noteworthy, many students skip breakfast to catch a few extra minutes of sleep or simply have established a routine to not eat in the morning. We've all heard that breakfast is the most important meal of the day, but what does that mean when it comes to how our brains function? With breakfast being the first meal you eat, it gets the body ready for the rest of the day. Not only is it building a foundation for the morning, it is also giving your body and brain the nutrients it needs to wake up, absorb information, and function. Studies have shown that when we eat breakfast, things like concentration, memory, and energy all improve, making one more alert and able to take in more information. Choosing the right foods to properly refuel your body and brain when you wake up can improve your focus and memory. Science also shows that the foods we eat first thing in the morning can improve our short-term memory and provide our bodies with the energy needed to focus and concentrate throughout the day. But there's a big difference between refueling our bodies and brains with the beneficial breakfast and eating something that will leave you feeling stuffed and sluggish. Beginning your day with a well-balanced meal can also lead to a better, more positive mood and mindset. When someone misses breakfast, studies show that it can cause your brain to produce an excess of cortisol, which is your body's primary stress hormone. When this happens, it can leave you feeling more stressed and anxious. According to a study conducted by the Center of Disease Control and Prevention, 82.4% of American children ages 2 to 19 eat breakfast. Still, that means nearly one in five children do not eat breakfast, with the likelihood of eating breakfast declining to a mere 50% as children get older. If you really think about it, if you haven't eaten all night, you have essentially fasted for 10 to 12 hours. Your blood sugar levels will be lower, which means your energy levels are depleting. Your body does, does not have the fuel it needs to begin the day. Over the last year and a half, diet and food access have changed significantly as a result of the stay-at-home guidelines. With more limited access to fresh fruits and vegetables, families whose income changed were forced to buy less expensive foods with lower nutritional value. Children and teens staying home began to eat less healthy meals and snack more. These snacks typically contained higher amounts of salty, sweet, and high-carb foods due to food availability changes and less frequent shopping trips. A 2020 study conducted by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute's Department of Science Education examined the health repercussions of COVID-19 for children and adolescents, including the increased risks for obesity and other health conditions. With childhood obesity already on the rise, it was found that the pandemic aided to an alarming increase in obesity in U.S. children and adolescents. 
The study noted a 19% increase in childhood obesity. Additionally, before the pandemic, children who were a healthy weight were gaining an average of 3.4 pounds a year. That rose to 5.4 pounds annually after the pandemic. For children who were moderately obese, expected weight gain rose from 6.5 pounds to 12 pounds. And for severely obese children, expected weight gain went from 8.8 .8 pounds to 14.6 pounds. In addition to an increase in our weight gain, children and adolescents also suffered from increased exposure to screen time and limited activity. The CDC recorded about a 50 to 70% increase in screen time during the COVID-19 pandemic. This is due to an increase in stationary behavior with more teens and children sitting and engaging in excessive screen time for both school and in entertainment. Through my personal experiences and observations, I have witnessed this firsthand. When I would check in on my virtual students, they often had the curtains drawn closed and were sitting in a dark room. When I would ask what they had done for the day, they were at a loss. There were often times where students were not even seeing daylight, getting outside, or even leaving their bedrooms. The health risks associated with poor diet are multiplied when they go hand in hand with less physical activity. According to a study conducted by Psychiatry Research, the pandemic-related school closures have directly affected 91% of the world's student population. As a result, adolescents experience a significant drop in their physical activity levels merely by staying home instead of going to school. With the lack of available recreation and sporting activities over the last year and a half, there has been a significant decrease in young people's opportunities for exercise. When teens are physically active, their mental health improves, in part because their brains have produced more endorphins, which are associated with positive mood. When physical activity decreases, not only is the release of endorphins reduced, but the serotonin and dopamine levels are affected as well. Change in these mood-influencing hormones can lead to depression, anxiety, and other mental health conditions. So that leaves us wondering, how does your body use food for fuel? I don't want to get too far into the scientific facts, but it's important to note how one's body can take the nutrients we are providing and make lasting changes. Essentially, your body needs energy to function and grow. Think of food as energy to charge up your battery for the day. Flashback to high school, I remember sitting in health class and learning about nutrition. We were given a whiteboard and instructed to draw a battery. After drawing the battery, we were asked to color in how much fuel we consumed within the previous day. We counted breakfast, snacks, lunch, and dinner. After drawing in the fuel levels, we were asked to erase a certain amount of it for learning, focusing, walking, exercise, activities, and sleep. After that, it displayed how much energy we had left. So I challenge you, think about how much energy you would have left after a day filled with eating and daily activities. How much energy are you taking in? How much fuel are you using? What about your children? Everyone's bodies are different in terms of what they need to stay alert and active throughout the day. The number of calories you need depends on your genes, age, weight, height, and how active you are. It is very individualized. After consumption, our bodies take the food we eat and break it down with enzymes and acids found within our stomach. When the stomach digests the food, the carbohydrates such as sugars and starches are broken down into another type of sugar called glucose. After the glucose gets absorbed, it is then released into the bloodstream where it can be used immediately for energy and stored in our bodies to use later. Diets high in refined sugars can be harmful to your brain. Multiple studies have found a correlation between diet high in refined sugars and impaired brain functioning, and even worsening symptoms of mood disorders such as depression. When I talk with students regarding their mental health and what we can do to improve it, one of the easiest and most often overlooked ways to maintain our mental health is through the role of nutrition. Believe it or not, mental health is very much linked to nutrition. Think about it, your brain is on 24-7. It takes care of your thoughts and movements, your breathing, your heartbeat, your senses, decision making. It even works while you're sleeping. This means your brain constantly requires a constant supply of fuel. To put it simply, what you eat directly affects the structure and function of your brain and ultimately your mood. I read an article by the Harvard Medical School a bit ago that compared our brain to an expensive car and that's something that has always stuck with me. With an expensive car, you put premium fuel in it. Same goes with our bodies. Eating high quality food that contains lots of vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants nourishes the brain and helps function. Unfortunately, like an expensive car, your brain can be damaged if you would digest anything other than premium fuel. And obviously the last thing you wanna do is ruin a luxury vehicle. 
When looking at the connection between diet and emotions, it is important to note the close relationship your brain has with your GI tract. Your GI tract is home to billions of bacteria that influence the production of neurotransmitters such as dopamine and serotonin, which carry the messages from your gut to your brain. This means when you eat healthy food, you're promoting the growth of good bacteria. If you fill your body with a poor balanced diet, that can cause inflammation, which hinders production of the neurotransmitters. Basically, good food equals good mood. Same goes for when you skip a meal or do not eat for an extended period of time. Without the food, the healthy bacteria is not growing, which directly impacts your mood. Have you ever heard of someone refer to themselves as hangry? That is 100% a real thing. I looked it up, trust me. So with all of that being said, what can we do to work together on our nutrition and the well-being of our children? Develop and encourage healthy eating habits. Provide plenty of fruits and vegetables and whole grain products. I know we're all busy, but if you can even go a step further and cut the fruit, that would make it more accessible. Include more low-fat and non-fat milk and dairy products, including cheese and yogurt. Choose lean meats, poultry, fish, lentils, and beans for protein. Encourage your family to drink lots of water. One helpful way of doing this is getting new water bottles. Some water bottles even have notches on the side to tell you where you should be throughout the day with your water consumption. Limit energy drinks and drinks filled with sugars. Limit consumption of sugars and saturated fats. Pack the pantry with goodies other than chips and cookies. Although okay in moderation, it is way too easy to grab a bag of chips and lay on the couch. Not speaking from personal experience. Another really fun way to encourage healthy eating is to cook together as a family. Although maybe not ideal with everyone's schedules, scheduling one day a week to all come together try new f and try new foods can be very impactful for your child and teach them the importance of healthy foods. And lastly, wake up 10 minutes earlier to ensure your student is eating breakfast. Thank you, Amy and Amanda, for the deep dive in exercise and nutrition and how it relates to mental health. Um, wonderful job. And thank you, administration. Um, for providing this opportunity to um, have tonight's discussion on some um, rich and timely topics that can hopefully um, make a difference in the lives of our families and our community. Um, and thank you parents and guardians for carving out the time for the, the very same um, purpose. We recognize that everybody's time is valuable. So welcome and good evening. Um, as previously mentioned, um, I'm Chuck Crone. I'm the House 3 School Social Worker here at the high school. And I'm here with you tonight to talk about the third foundational pillar of mental health, sleep. We're gonna spend some time particularly focusing on how the last 18 months have affected our sleep, both as adults and children. Over this time, we as school social workers have had many, many conversations about the shift in presentation and overarching needs of our students. Really, we were noticing three different groups of students, or th that students fell um, into one of three different groups. <clears throat> the first group, was a, a smaller group of students, and that small, smaller group of students was, um, were a group of students that uh, did better. They, for very unique and specific reasons, um, they did a little bit better over the pandemic. Um, second group of students, the largest group of students, were students that, um, that did okay on the surface, but they um, generally felt um, changes in three different areas. Um, there were students that maybe were traditionally A students and were now B minus students. Uh, there were students that um, maybe generally felt optimistic and ambitious and um, looked forward to school, but didn't feel as optimistic and lost some of that ambition, maybe didn't like school as much. Um, and, and also, uh, they were students that maybe um, in the past had missed three or four days of school, um, and in the past 18 months or, or per, per school year, you know, maybe missed 10, 12, or 14 days of school. And, uh, and so they, they shifted, um, or maybe there were students that maybe um, failed their first class um, ever um, in the pandemic, but generally passed everything um, in the past. Uh, and the third group of students was uh, a group of students that was made up of either students that we um, were already aware of that had some pre-existing struggles, um, students that maybe we might know to be students that seek out support in school from time to time, 
Um, but also it was comprised of another type of student, and that student um, often was um, perhaps a really high achieving student that maybe had grades in the high 90s, um, loved school, had lots of friends, was engaged in ex extracurriculars um, and, um, and you know, clubs and sports, um, and you know, really just liked school. <clears throat> but this third group of students were the group that really just fell off the proverbial cliff. Um, for a lack of a better way to put it. Um, they were students that uh, in some cases um, not only just stopped coming to school or logging on, but uh, perhaps didn't, you know, weren't coming out of their bedroom or were refusing to come out of their bedroom, keeping their shades uh, drawn all day, um, and in, in some cases um, considering self-harm. And, uh, and, the, and these students um, required a lot of, a lot of support and in, in um, just about every case, I think uh, you know, we were able to turn some things around. But th that final group of students um, really, really stood out to us in the pandemic for sure. And um, as we looked at all three groups, what we noticed, and most specifically in that second and that third group, um, were that there were significant sleep disturbances. Um, to give you an example, um, it was not uncommon for a student, especially in that third group, to, to walk into a, one of our offices and the conversation would go something like this. Um, you know, Mr. Crone, I just, uh, I don't feel myself. I feel off. I don't really, um, I don't really care as much about school and um, I know I, I need to pass, but I just don't have the energy to do it and I just want to feel better. Um, and so as school social workers and caring adults, um, you know, some of the first questions that we would ask are, were, um, how did you sleep last night? And if, it, if this was a hybrid student or while we were in the hybrid model, um, the student would respond um, that they woke up at like 6.15 or 6.30. And so we'd also have some interest on the previous day before that. Um, and we would say, you know, what time did you wake up yesterday? Which would have been like a, um, an asynchronous day. And without hesitation, in just about every single case, the answers were maybe 9, 9.30. So there was like a three hour swing there. But in the majority of cases, students said without any hesitation, one o'clock, two o'clock, and 3 p.m. And, and I think they didn't hesitate because this was not something that there was stigma attached to. In fact, some of these students, I didn't know at all. And they were open to talking about this because it wasn't, it wasn't personal. Um, but they didn't hesitate. Because I think generally speaking, when we think about sleep as adults or as teenagers, the, the, the thought is that more sleep is better and that we could all use more. And so if you can sleep in, why not? Um, but really what was happening is in the best case scenario where they were going, uh, or I should say they were waking up three hours later on asynchronous days or three and a half hours later, that was the equivalent of essentially jet lagging yourself um, like you would if you were flying back and forth to the West Coast in a 24 hour period. So here we have, in the best case scenario, masses of students essentially flying back and forth to California every other day and nobody's thinking anything of it. Um, but in the majority of cases, like I said, it was 1, 2, 3 p.m., which is equivalent to flying halfway around the world. So this, this really caught our attention. Um, you know, the, the, the changes um, in, in the times were jet lagging, which throws off your dopamine, your cortisol, your serotonin production, digestion, um, the times at which you socialize, when oxytocin is released in your body. So it had some pretty significant effects. Um, and, uh, and so this was uh, a nice opportunity to connect with students that wouldn't typically um, reach out to a counselor um, because we're able to engage students in, in these discussions um, that didn't involve um, anything through their eyes, highly personal, um, and uh, didn't need, um, the, the discussion did not involve uh, making an appointment with a, a counselor or a doctor or a psychiatrist. So um, I can think of one particular student that, um, that kind of fell into this, well not kind of, absolutely fell into that third category where they were falling off the cliff, the proverbial cliff, um, figuratively. <clears throat> and um, it was a student that absolutely um, was not a student that would typically reach out 
um, to talk to anybody, um, any adult in the building about um, personal stuff. And uh, our house counselor um, brought him over to me and he stood in the threshold of my doorway and it was abundantly clear that he um, really just didn't want to engage. But I started with, um, you know, hey, can I, can I keep you for a couple minutes and um, asked him how he was sleeping and it, the conversation unfolded in the exact way that I just, uh, in the exact example that I just shared with you. And, and I said to, um, to, this, uh, to this student, um, actually I explained, we talked for a while about the science behind sleep and why it's important. Some of the, a lot of the things that we're gonna talk about tonight. And I said to the student at the end, um, I, if, I could, if I could bet, if I could gamble in school, which we can't, I would bet you a thousand dollars a thousand, a thousand dollars right now that if you are able to um, keep your uh, sleep schedule consistent within no more than an hour change over the next four to five days, um, you would notice significant measurable differences in how you feel about um, the things that are happening around you or remote learning or not having sports or um, you know, how you feel about school in general, that those things might not change, but your feeling and your perception on them would shift and your, your coping ability would change. And so um, the student said, you know, I think you're onto something. And uh, surprisingly, um, he took me up on the challenge. And this was on, I think, a Monday. And that Friday um, of that week, um, I had a surprise visit at my door. And the student walked in and he said, you know, Mr. Crone, um, if your ears are ringing, I have the answer why. I, I've been telling everybody about this sleep thing, like it's the real deal. It actually makes a difference. And I thought, nah, who paid you to tell me what you think I want to hear? Because that sounds awesome. Um, and this student continued to um, benefit from significant and ongoing um, um, changes uh, to how he was able to cope by managing his sleep schedule. It wasn't perfect moving forward, but he knew when he fell off the wagon what to do to get back on. And we had lots of these conversations with lots of students and we saw lots of change. We had conversations with some of you as parents. And I think for you guys, it was um, parents and guardians, it was an easy conversation to have with your kid because again, it wasn't personal. Um, the struggle comes in um, you know, making um, lifestyle changes because it is a lifestyle change. So we took this, this experience um, and <clears throat> knowledge um, into February break and spring break. Um, because we knew that with February and spring break, kids would not have synchronous, asynchronous days. It was the same day every day. And so when they came back from break, uh, you know, we'd say, hey, how did break go? Did you do anything fun? Um, and invariably, um, every student that I, I know that I worked with um, indicated that they felt better after break. And if we're being, you know, fair, it probably wasn't because of reduced academic um, demands over break because, as we all know, um, schools across the country have been um, considerably more flexible in that area um, over the pandemic. It was because kids were um, maybe waking up at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, but they were waking up at 3 o'clock in the afternoon every afternoon. Um, or maybe it was 11 o'clock or 9 o'clock every day. Um, and in many cases, um, in the wintertime, they were outside playing, um, you know, or having snowball fights with their friends. And around spring break, they were uh, with families on some form of vacation. So they were up moving around, getting sunlight, which affects, you know, some of the things that Amy and Amanda were talking about, um, you know, with exercise and with the gut. Um, because light exposure and movement um, affect gut bacteria and your gut communicates with your brain through the vagus nerve um, with um, you know, the creation of dopamine, serotonin, um, the release of cortisol, which we'll get into in a little bit. Um, so as Amy mentioned um, earlier, that this was really, at least um, in the 16 years that I've been doing my job, the first time systemically that our students experienced multiple blows on multiple fronts and all at once. Socially, with family stress, you know, um, and some people in some cases um, losing their jobs or having to work remotely from home and the adjustment with that. Um, fear of, you know, what's going on around them, the uncertainty. Um, routine and structure, clearly very much disrupted. Anxiety about the virus in many cases and um, the adjustment to remote learning. 
In fact, <clears throat> there was a, a Harvard study um, that um, was conducted from, um, or I'm sorry, that showed results from um, November 2020 to January 2021 that indicated in this time period, 66% of seven to 15 year olds reported clinical levels of anxiety and depression, which was up from 30% before the pandemic. The CDC indicated that from March to October of 2020, psychiatric ER visits rose by 24% for five to 11 year olds and 31% for 12 to 17 year olds. And this was on top of an already rising anxiety and depression um, uh, trajectory pre-pandemic. That same Harvard study found that those with more structured routines, exercise and less screen time had fewer symptoms of anxiety and depression. Ages eight to 14 are also known to be particularly delicate because this is a period where there's greater neuroplasticity in the brain and when mental health typically emerges. So um, th those ages eight to 14, um, this was, this the, the past 18 months provided uh, a really good opportunity for us to um, model and manage um, structure and routine, um, especially for those uh, ages eight to 14, as this was a, a delicate time um, in their brain development. Uh, it was also found that the biggest driver of well being during COVID is parental functioning, and uh, doctors and mental health providers have noted an unfortunate significant rise in abuse and neglect, substance abuse mental illness and divorce. We all have our, our own unique routines and rhythms to help us get through the day. Um, waking up in the morning, going to bed, for example, waking up in, in the morning, might um, the very first thing you might do might be to check your cell phone and then get up and brush your teeth and then take a shower and then have your coffee. Um, and at night, it might be hopefully read a book um, or drink some tea or do something relaxing, but you, ha you have your own routine at night that um, should be preparing your body and your mind for sleep. Our bodies are the same, biologically speaking. Um, we have a biological rhythm that many of you, I'm sure, have heard of by now because the re research has exploded, but it's called the circadian rhythm. And like anything else with our body, it's possible and not uncommon for our circadian rhythms to be in disorder. For those of you that are wondering, where does this word circadian come from? I looked it up and circa means about and dies means day. So as we move forward in this discussion of, of sleep and um, wellness, there are four essential things for life. Oxygen so that we can breathe, water so that we are hydrated, food so that we are nourished, and sleep so that we can function. Circadian rhythms are our body's internal clock located in the, let me see if I can get this right, suprachiasmatic nucleus in the hypothalamus, which conveys time-based time -based information through bodily fluids and neural pathways. Like old time clocks, the internal clock, our internal clock, needs to be reset every day to precisely 24 hours. And this is done primarily by exposure to the light and dark cycle. It's responsible for our body temperature, metabolism, digestion, hunger, learning and memory consolidation, hormone secretion, growth and development, infection control, and mood regulation. And a regular rhythm can result in mood, mood disorders, including anxiety, depression, bipolar disorder, and seasonal affective disorder. Two of the biggest Endocrine issues with an irregular rhythm are melatonin and cortisol disruptions. A dysregulated, here's another one, hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis, HPA axis, a dysregulated HPA axis and cortisol is associated with major depressive disorder. Major depressive disorders have, diagnoses have increased worldwide by 18% from 2005 to 2015. And these rates correlate with the modernization of society, which we'll talk a little about in a little bit. <clears throat> a discussion of circadian rhythm and mental health wouldn't be complete without discussing chronotype. 
um, chronotype, for those of you that don't, that don't already know, is basically um, whether or not you're a morning person or a night person or a morning lark or a night owl. Uh, and it's been found that your type actually has an effect on the choice of emotional coping um, strategies that you choose, including assertiveness, rationalization, predisposi and predisposition to psychological disorders. It's also been found that the severity of depression correlates with the degree of misalignment of your circadian rhythm in your sleep cycles. There's a bi-directional relationship between mood disorders, circadian rhythms, and ser serotonin secretion, which is due to jet lag, social jet lag, shift work, or exposure to artificial light at night. I just mentioned social jet lag. That might be a new term for you. I know that when um, I was doing my research, um, it, was, it was a new term, but the idea was not new. Um, it's kind of what was happening um, throughout the pandemic, and we'll talk about that. So social jet lag, by definition, is remaining in your time zone, but significantly shifting sleep-wake patterns several days per week, which changes the timing of light exposure. <clears throat> this happens in transitions to and from weekends, which is a big part of why you and I and many people um, use alarm clocks. Specifically, about 80% of us use alarm clocks. Nowadays, it happens to be more of the alarm on your cell phone and not a standalone device. Social jet lag is also associated with, are you ready for this? Poor attention, learning difficulties, and a range of health consequences, including depressive symptoms and other mental health diagnoses. Bedtimes, wake times, light exposure, social interactions, and mealtimes all act as cues that tell our bodies what time it is and when to prepare for sleep. I'm gonna stop just for a second um, to talk about uh, sleep cycles. Um, what we noticed also uh, with, our, with our students was very likely a loss of, um, a significant loss um, of deep sleep and REM sleep. And this is anecdotal, because I didn't, you know, we didn't, link up to their, their, um, their uh, Apple Watches or anything. But um, we know that, that deep sleep happens um, primarily in the first um, half of the night of sleep, that it occurs in the first half uh, of sleep. And REM sleep occurs in the second half of the night of sleep. So if you sleep from 8 p.m. to 4 p.m., you're getting the majority of your deep sleep from 8 to midnight and the majority of your REM sleep from midnight to 4. 4 a.m. So when you have a student who's shifting their wake time from 6 a.m. to 3 p.m. every other day, their bodies tend to get confused about when and how, how long they should, when they should enter deep and REM sleep and how long they should stay in deep and REM sleep. And, and ultimately, at least every other day, they were losing a significant amount of that. And deep sleep, as you might already know, um, is really responsible for your um, cellular repair, cellular repair. Um, human growth hormone release um, and your immune system and basically, you know, all re repairing and resetting all of the physical bodily functions throughout the night. And REM sleep, we know, is foundational to good mental health. Um, REM sleep is where um, your brain consolidates experiences and memories um, from, from the day and tries to make sense of them um, so that it can prepare you for the next time and the next day. And we know that if you don't have um, REM sleep, Generally, um, there's going to be some link to some mental health there um, in some capacity. So for the first time in history, all of these elements have impacted our kids. When schools across the country uh, pivoted to a hybrid model, um, for those that were in, in hybrid, um, there would be cohort A and cohort B. And uh, cohort A students could be best friends with cohort B students. So for some, it was a Friday night and others it was a Sunday night, depending on whether or not they had physical school the next day. Can you guess which night won out most of the time? Yeah, it was the Friday night. Um, so imagine what that was doing for the kid who had physical school the next day and had to be up at six, six o'clock in the morning. <clears throat> so we're talking about um, light and circadian rhythm. Um, light, as I uh, previously said, is the most significant cue to the body. Um, in determining day from night. And just uh, for a second here, we'll talk about light. Light, uh, for those of you that don't already know, um, is measured it, um, in lux. So lux, L-U-X, um, is a measurement of how much light is in a given space. Um, so less than three lux of light is effective in suppressing the onset of melatonin secretion and its duration. 
ultimately altering our physiology and behavior. And for those of you that supplement um, in, at night or with your kids with melatonin, um, I think we found something that's considerably more powerful than taking maybe you know five milligrams of melatonin, and that's our body's own natural um, way of producing it. Over the past 100 years, the boundaries between day and night have been obscured by widespread adoption of electric light at night. Before electricity, we were exposed to, are you ready for this? Between 0.1 and 0.3 lux at night from a moon. I'm sorry, from the moon. For reference, a candle three feet away produces exactly one lux. And so for the first time in history, humans could extend the day Resolving fears of nighttime crime, fires, supernatural, that sort of thing. And the economy benefited from night shifts. By the year 2000, technology provided us with additional sources of nighttime light. TVs, TVs in multiple rooms, computer screens, e-readers, phones, tablets. Today, more than 99% of Americans experience significant nighttime light pollution. The artificial night sky, I'm sorry, the artificial night sky glow is so bright that 80% of North America can't see the Milky Way. The average urban street ranges from between five and 15 lux. And the typical living room is, are you ready for this one? Between 100 and 300 lux, with tablets being around 40 lux. With the modernization in society, we've also seen increases, as I previously uh, indicated, in major depressive disorder from 2005 to 2015 by 18%. It's no wonder why. There, and it's also been uh, found that there's a strong link between all forms of depression and jet lag and social jet lag. And it's been determined that the most successful treatments for these that target circadian rhythm adjustments are bright light therapy, wake therapy, social rhythm therapy, and medication, which again, all affect the circadian rhythm. Blue light has been found um, to most strongly stimulate the retina cells and red light um, having the least amount of stimulation on the retina cells, which is why we have those blue, light, I'm sorry, those blue light blocking glasses. Say that five times. Um, and uh, have, have been tremendously effective. We know that the sun has more blue during the day and shifts to red wavelengths at night. And so the goal is obviously to replicate um, very similar light exposure indoors. Back to mental health, um, uh, very specifically just for a second. Um, bipolar disorder, it's been uh, determined through the, the, the literature that it is 85 to 89% hereditary and that it's potentially a genetic um, issue with the molecular clock and the cause and effect is currently still being studied. However, you might find this interesting. Those with bipolar disorder who fly east to west develop depressive symptoms and those that, that fly west to east, typically who have an advance in their circadian rhythm, develop mania or manic, manic uh, type symptoms. These uh, symptoms generally take several days for our bodies to synchronize to the light social interactions and meal timings results in disturbed I'm sorry and results in disturbed sleep fatigue hormonal swings GI issues and changes in mood now you don't have bi have to have bipolar disorder to experience those things I think we all experience jet jet lag when we fly but I think um, the effects are are often more pronounced in those with bipolar disorder it appears that those ha that have bipolar disorder have fast running circadian clocks leading to chronic circadian disruption. We know that lithium slows the clock, stabilizing the rhythm, and that bipolar depression um, that is treated um, using the circadian rhythm um, approach um, is best treated by midday bright light therapy and bipolar mania is treated by enforced darkness, um, either environmentally or with blue light blocking glasses. Fifteen to twenty percent of Americans work night shifts, and really, they are the canaries in the coal mine for how disrupted circadian rhythms affect our health. They suffer several health disparities compared to the rest of us, including increased cancer, 
cardiovascular disease, metabolic disorders, and behavioral and psychiatric disorders. There's actually um, uh, a, a clinical diagnostic um, uh, classification uh, diagnosis um, for those that um, end up with uh, circadian disruption from night shifts and, uh, and experience it on a clinical level. It's called shift work disorder. And you can find that uh, in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. And it affects 10 to 23, 10 to 23% of shift or rotating shift workers and includes symptoms of insomnia, difficulty falling asleep, excessive sleepiness, micronaps, irritability, depression, and difficulty maintaining personal relationships. They found that medication for shift work disordered people is largely ineffective and that they are 40% more likely to develop depression and anxiety in part due to light exposure at night. Treatments that include normalizing the circadian rhythm have been proven to be most effective. <clears throat> A recent study analyzing digital log on student from uh, digital log on data from students not around here um, from nearly 15,000 students reported that social jet lag negatively affects learning outcomes. So with handheld and wrist-worn mobile devices today, it may be possible in the future, in, in, in approved context, to leverage data, either as parents or uh, research institutions, to predict and monitor real-time behavioral indicators of depression, PTSD, and state changes in, in bipolar disorder. Additionally, with cameras and light sensors, they may be able to um, obtain um, information about ambient light and the effects of uh, light exposure to all the things that we've talked about tonight and quantify that data. So I think we set out um, uh, to promise um, to provide you with some concrete, boots on the ground, actionable, real things that we can do to make a difference without necessarily having to make an appointment, although um, it may have been previously stated that, uh, um, that it is always appropriate to seek out um, a health, health professional um, and your providers, um, and that there certainly is a, um, a appropriate and, and, uh, an appropriate place for medication. Um, but to provide you with um, actionable, concrete uh, things that you can do at home uh, for yourself and with your family to move the needle and to um, experience some significant um, positive change. And so that's what we're gonna um, conclude with here um, for the sleep portion. So what to do, what can we do? What are some action steps? As educators, um, we could be asking where in context um, Students to record sleep diaries and think about sleep timing, quality, and quantity of their sleep, and 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 discuss how changes um, to the routines regarding caffeine intake, exercise time, um, and how to switch off before bed may positively impact them. I know that I do that one on one with students. Um, I, I think I shared um, a couple of, uh, or at least one one example of that over the pandemic. I'm able to do that one on one. Um, but I certainly do that, and I think um, my colleagues do as well. Uh, teachers, nurses, counselors, administrators um, should also be encouraged to ask about sleep when students are experiencing distress. Um, you would think that uh, you know sometimes these things would just naturally come up, that kids might say that I'm tired, but uh, they don't always say that. Um, sometimes they do a good job of putting on a mask. So, um, what can what can what are the things that you can do at home? Those are some of the things that we can do as educators. What are some of the things that you can do at home? Well, I'd first encourage um, sleeping in 90-minute chunks. That is because um, um, the sleep stages um, comprise a sleep cycle, and some of the stages indicate there's four stages. Some say I'm sorry. Some of the models say four stages. Some say five stages. But for all intents and purposes, a whole sleep cycle includes deep sleep, REM sleep, light sleep, and um, it takes um, 90 minutes to complete a full sleep cycle. And you really don't want to wake up in the middle of that 90 minute cycle, uh, because if you do, you're going to be off. You know, the, the cortisol release and all the chemical reactions that happen in your body um, by completing each one of these stages of sleep is off, and you're probably going to feel a little off for the rest of the day. Um, that's why some of these smart alarm clocks 
that um, you know you tell it what time you need to wake up and it'll tell you what time to go to bed will tell you to go to bed actually later even if you're ready to go to bed now um, and 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 that's uh, again um, we want want to make sure that we're getting in um, adequate deep and REM sleep um, and sleeping in six I'm sorry in 90 minute chunks achieves that so um, we're looking at six hours seven and a half hours nine hours um, or ten and a half hours and uh, I think um, nine seems to be optimal in a lot of cases but um, if we can even shoot in some cases uh, for six to start with um, that's where we start and that's actually time sleeping not time in bed and consistency um, encourage your student to have um, a consistent sleep schedule as we as we um, learn in the literature and was validated through some of my anecdotal experience with students over February and spring break um, it is most important first to go to bed and wake up at about the same time with not more than about an hour variance every day than it is to get the extra three hours every other day um, avoid screen time 60 to 90 minutes before bed again it's the blue light um, preventing serotonin production in your body um, so avoiding screen time 60 to 90 minutes before bed that also prevents um, additional stimuli or video games or things that could be emotionally arousing no meals no heavy meals three hours before bed um, that might sound difficult I know it's difficult for me sometimes but anything that requires any any serious digestion or is a heavy meal you want to have no um, no uh, closer to bed than three hours um, and so you might have that meal then and maybe have, plan a really light snack um, you know an hour and a half later and and then um, you know just really be careful not to eat too much before bed because what happens is it turns on digestion and digestion prevents your body from entering deep sleep um, and so you start to lose deep sleep that way um, no caffeine after 2 p.m. Um, kind of a no-brainer but the reason for that is that ca caffeine has a half-life of six hours and that also prevents um, deep sleep and it actually affects I think all stages of sleep but um, most notably deep sleep avoid alcohol obviously for students but um, on your end um, as well um, alcohol we know also disrupts um, how much deep sleep and the um, order of your sleep stages um, sleep in um, a room or try to keep the room that you're sleeping in at about 63 degrees and that might sound chilly for some of you I think the range the ideal range is between 63 and 67 degrees and if it sounds cold it might be in a little bit of an acquired taste kind of like you know coffee uh, is an acquired taste but if you um, if you can um, you know just make sure you have good blankets um, and you're, you're breathing in the, the cool air you know you may find that you're comfortable um, and that you're getting better more sound quality rest um, keeping your room um, cool uh, white noise um, many people love it some people hate it and um, probably most haven't tried it but white noise is fantastic at um, smoothing out I think it's your um, low brain or slow brain waves um, but it's fantastic at um, regulating your brain waves um, but most importantly tuning out um, extraneous sounds around you so maybe the dog um, you know moving around through the house or a window closing or a door closing the, the things that can distract us and keep us awake at night um, keeping your room dark for obvious reasons um, we just talked about uh, light exposure the darker the room the better um, keeping your, your bedroom um, primarily utilized just for sleep not having a TV in there is really good um, as well uh, and if your room is really dark uh, a thing that you can kind of do to supercharge um, the dark room effect is to have uh, a, an alarm clock that's a sunrise simulator Philips has a more expensive one um, but there's cheaper ones out there now uh, on on Amazon and other places that um, that are considerably cheaper and basically what they do is if your alarm is set for 630 at 6 o'clock before your alarm clock goes off it starts to glow, glow a really dim orange glow and it becomes brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter almost to a perfect white and by the time your alarm clock goes off um, you've simulated the sunrise you have um, turned off serotonin pr uh, production in your body and it's easier and more natural to wake up um, I have one and it works great I've been using it for four years um, absolutely absolutely wonderful thing um, and um, another is um, blue light blocking glasses if there's one thing the research is showing if there's one thing that you can buy or do 
that is not a, ultimately a lifestyle change. It's buying blue light blocking glasses. That's the one thing that has made the most consistent um, improvement in people's sleep quality. And um, last, <clears throat> um, avoid strenuous physical activity 90 minutes before bed. Uh, and the reason for that is, is that what, it obviously raises our heart rate, gets our blood pumping, um, but um, even physical activity, which is healthy for you, as Amy pointed out um, earlier, um, it, uh, even though it's healthy for you, it puts your body into fight or flight or sympathetic um, response. And uh, in order to get quality sleep, you need to be in parasympathetic or rest and digest, um, not fight or flight mode, but rest and digest mode. And, uh, and it takes a while for that to happen. It's not just like a switch. So if you do something strenuous, close to bed, you're gonna find that if you have a wearable, wearable I have a ring, but if you have like an Apple Watch, um, it will show that uh, it takes a while for your resting heart rate to drop throughout the night. <clears throat> So, so those are some concrete, tangible, actionable things that I hope that, um, that you can take home with you tonight and can begin to make a difference like it has for the students that we've seen here in school and certainly in my own home. Um, they really, really move the needle. Um, but I'm gonna leave you with this. There was a quote, and I thought it was fantastic, by a renowned sleep scientist who said, if sleep doesn't serve some vital function, then it is the biggest mistake evolution ever made. Thank you for your time tonight. I hope you go home and get some restful sleep and that uh, you can share some of these things with your family um, and enjoy uh, a more um, peaceful tomorrow with more energy and uh, thank you. As we conclude our discussion on the foundations of mental health and mid recovery from the pandemic, I would like to extend our gratitude towards your interest in our presentation. I know I can safely speak for Chuck and Amy when I say that we are all here for you and your child during this difficult time. Additionally, I would like to thank the district for this opportunity for Chuck, Amy, and I to share some very educational and important information with you all. Within this slide, you will find our contact information. We will now conclude with a question and answer session. Please feel free to type your questions in the chat box. Thank you. Chuck, can you hear me? Hi, hi Sarah, yes, we can hear you. Hi, thank you so much, that was excellent. We do have a few questions that came into the Q&A. Um, the first one is a question regarding the nutrition benefits that were mentioned during Amanda's presentation. The person is asking, knowing these nutrition benefits, especially with breakfast, is there anything as a district we can do to improve the meals we serve students in our buildings? I know they meet guidelines of some measure. However, I think we can agree we could do better, especially considering the increased number of students taking advantage of these free meals this year. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your question, I appreciate it. Um, so this is a great question and although I am not um, on the deciding factor of this, I know there is always whole options available for, at our schools for all students. Uh, this is something I speak with my students on regularly. I know it's easy to take a piece of pizza every day, especially when it's readily available. Um, from my end, I always encourage students to choose healthier options such as the fruits, veggies, and salads. Um, but I can always partner with you in your concerns and there's always room to explore this. Thank you, Amanda. The next question say, uh, states, I am actually noticing more anxiety now with more routines with my child. My child is overwhelmed with this sudden management of everything. During hybrid, she had more time to complete work, talk to friends, play a school and travel sport with less, with less games, small class sizes and no final exams. Double the size of classes, more demands and a lot of pressure to catch up happened suddenly. Are you noticing this too? Is this being addressed with our students or staff at all? I'll take that one. Um, it's Amy here. Definitely, in fact, I feel like I could have talked to your child today. I just had a situation that's almost exact um, and having several of these conversations. I think as Chuck pointed out in his presentation, um, there are uh, definitely some kids that this worked, that hybrid worked for better and some kids that um, the everyday works for better. 
we're finding a transition because students are sort of at this point used to not being in school every day or having all that extra time. So I'm definitely noticing that. And the focus that I've been going to for that is really about balance. Um, since it is a transition back for some students, that might mean taking, at least at the high school level, maybe not taking as many electives this quarter or this semester, um, slowing things down a little bit in terms of um, you know, the travel sports and the school sports. It really is independent. You know, some kids do really well being busy all the time, and some are just really struggling at this point. We are seeing a rise in anxiety in general. Um, and it is, it is definitely, I, I, again, I think as I talked about, we're going to get back to that resiliency phase and we're going to get back to people feeling the way that they used to. But in the interim, it might mean um, anxiety gives you a reason. It says, pay attention to me, that something needs to change. So I think it's important that you look individually at what is happening for your child and um, what might be able to be taken off the plate at the time, just to sort of readjust things and make things um, a little bit easier. Also feel free to um, use your resources to give one of the social workers a call either in the high school or any of the other buildings and kind of talk through what some of that anxiety is or the individual situations and maybe learn some coping strategies, um, learning how to manage things better um, and just balancing. But yes, your child is not alone. We're definitely seeing that all three of us, I have to say. Um, and it is a concern and it looks to me like it's gonna take a bit to get back sort of to our normal. And I think understanding that um, and expecting that is part of the healing process when we're getting back to figuring out um, how to run again at the speed that we were running before the pandemic. Thank you, Amy. The next question asks, is there any reason not to wear blue light blocking lenses throughout the entire day? Hi, it's me again. Um, I'll take that question. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And I recall um, personally um, myself, just on my own journey uh, for, for better sleep, um, researching that very same question, not even for this presentation. And I think what we find is that um, serotonin um, levels drop um, in the morning um, so that you can wake up and your cortisol levels rise, which they're supposed to in the morning. Um, and so you don't want to dis disrupt the decrease in um, serotonin um, because you want to be able to be awake for the rest of the day. So I think, don't quote me, but I think it's like around three o'clock, two or three o'clock for a person that has a normal wake and sleep cycle that, that's with the sunrise and sunset, that around three o'clock is when your serotonin levels start to increase again. Um, um, I'm sorry, the serotonin uh, Ser the serotonin in your body actually results in melatonin production in your body. So when we say serotonin, we're also talking about melatonin. So you really, um, if you're going to wear them more than just before bed, probably the optimal time, as long as you don't really like, there's no risk in becoming sleepier, would be three o'clock on. And some people do that. Some people will start to wear blue light blocking glasses around three o'clock um, until, until bedtime. And, and I think also, you know, there's, there's other uh, things to consider with blue light, blue light blocking glasses. They're not, not all created equally. Some block more blue light than others. Some are fashionable. Some, you know, um, you can get prescription blue light blocking glasses. So if you're wearing uh, prescription eyewear, you know, certainly that's, uh, that's a thing to consider too. But, um, but yeah, if you're going to wear them, ideally you wouldn't wear them um, in, early in the morning uh, because you want, you want your body to experience the natural um, blue light that's in the sun earlier than earlier in the day that transitions to more red uh, red light um, wavelengths um, later in the evening. So uh, you don't want to disrupt that process. Thank you, Chuck. Sure. The next question says, my teen goes to bed too late. I can't force him to go to bed any earlier. Any suggestions? I'm gonna hand this one over to Amy. Thanks, Chuck. Um, so in full disclosure, I have two teenagers, older teenagers, and I totally relate to this. Um, and it is definitely a challenge. You can't make your teenager necessarily go to sleep. And what I can say is do your best to model the behavior that you're looking for from your, for your teenager. So all devices down in one area of the house, mandatory. Um, and also um, you um, encouraging um, you know, more of that quiet time and it's the expectation in the house that, that things are, are quieter and there aren't, um, there aren't screens in bedrooms, but that you're expected to be in your room at that time. Hopefully that helps move the needle at least a little bit to get students or your kids to realize that, um, that you're valuing sleep 
and you understand that it's important. Um, but that's, it's tough. It, you cannot make your teenager, but again, conversations and them having a little bit better understanding of really why it's important. And when they're tired the next day, you know, having them going back to let's move that bedtime back a little bit at a time, you know, 15 minutes at a time um, in chunks and, and really talking about that value of sleep. But it's a challenge. I'm, I'm not going to say that it's not, but in our high school, um, especially, we are here very early um, and it is um, imperative that our students do, we do our best to get our kids to go to bed as early as we can. Thank you, Amy. We have one final question that just came in. Um, this person is asking if there are any clubs or initiatives at the high school that support some of the topics that you mentioned tonight. So tonight being, so yeah. being more geared toward parents, is there anything that we're doing to support this mission at the high school? Yeah, absolutely. So I can't speak for all of the elementary and middle schools, but at the high school, we do have a wellness club, which shameless plug me and Mr. Crone do run. Um, and your student can get involved by checking the announcements and seeing when our meetings are. But I do know that our district is very forward on the wellness of our students. So you can always reach out to your school social worker at any level to figure out what's going on. I know there's clubs and activities and maybe some activities going on within the district. Thank you, Amanda. And I will just add for on behalf of the elementary buildings that we do have a new elective this year or a new special area subject that we are um, having a wellness teacher at all four of our elementary schools who is teaching a lot of these strategies, a lot of these topics and covering a lot of information related to wellness in response to everything that our students have gone through over the last two years. I do think that is all I'm just checking one more time to make sure no other questions just popped up. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time and your presentation tonight. And thank you to all of our community for joining us. I know we have a lot of staff members, parents, families who joined us tonight. Thank you. And thank you to our three social workers at the high school for presenting this important information to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.